All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today and joining us for another session of Models of Native Cooperative Ownership. My name is Justin Carter. I'm a project associate with the Center for Rural Affairs. And it's so great to have you all today. Uh, we are hosting Koala Arts and Crafts, and we're really privileged to have Tanya Carroll with us today to share their story. And we're also privileged to have Pamela Standing with us today uh, to facilitate. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it right over to Pamela. We're just so happy to have you here, Tanya, and to share about Koala Arts and Crafts. And um, I'm just, I just want you to get started. We'll just let you go and get started. Okay, well, um, let's see here. I can change the slides. Okay. Shiona Gada, Tanya Ke Kola Dagwadoa. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Carroll, and I am presenting on Kuala Arts and Crafts today. I'm really happy to be here and honored that you invited me to speak on this wonderful organization. So I'm an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and we are one of the three federally recognized Cherokee tribes. We are, um, I'll talk a little bit about our location on the next few slides. Um, I used to work at Kuala Arts and Crafts um, as the outreach coordinator, and I'm currently serving on their Cherokee Talents Board as the secretary, and that's their nonprofit side of their business. And I've had about 31 years of working with Cherokee artists and arts and crafts experience. So we are located in Western North Carolina. It's the town is called Cherokee and locally we call it the Koala boundary. And this is land that Cherokee people purchased back from people that had settled in North Carolina after our land was lost um, through treaties and land lotteries and things like that. And so uh, people were able to purchase different tracts of land. And then in 1924, it was put in trust with the federal government. And so the area, it's probably about 65,000 acres now. And it is, um, we call it the Kuala boundary. Kuala comes from it actually means Polly in Cherokee, and it's named after a local woman that was um, just very well known in the community. And so that's where the name comes from. Okay. So Kuala Arts and Crafts was founded in 1946. We just celebrated our uh, 75th year anniversary. And we've always focused on providing a year-round marketplace for our members to sell their arts and crafts. And we work to promote their workmanship, their design, and we work to help crafts, craftspeople and secure better prices for their work. I'm sure those of you that you know work with Native artists, going from the gathering to the preparing to the actual making of the arts and crafts that they do, a lot of people don't realize or appreciate the amount of time and work that goes into it. And sometimes people that aren't aware of that are really shocked to see some of those price tags. And so we really work to help other people understand that there's a lot more that goes into our artwork. Let me minimize this. So, I told you that we were founded in 1946. And then I also said that, um, so I call, we local people call it just the co-op, um, Kuala Arts and Crafts. And we are a member organization and it is juried membership. So I'll explain how the membership requirements work. And, and that's how we were set up from the beginning. So we have right now over 300 members and they're all enrolled in the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. We do sell um, artwork from other tribes that come in and we just have a separate section of our store for that. And 
So the membership requirements, we have an application that someone has to fill out. You have to be at least 16 years old or older, and you have to present at least five things that you have made along with your application. We do this twice a year. And then once we get your work and your application, our board members who are also members of our organization as artists will review the application and your work. Then they will schedule time for you to come in as an artist and demonstrate that you actually are the person that makes the work. Once that is done, the, the board will vote to see if you go on to the next process, which is going before the entire membership at our meetings, and then they will vote. And if the majority of those people vote, then you become a member. And once you're a member, you're a member uh, for life. I'm trying to get back so I can see some of you. And so once that happens, you become a member, and then we're able to purchase artwork from you and then resell it in the store. And so that's something that we do. It's not um, commission-based or it's not based on, you know, you bring your items and leave them with us. And if they sell, you get the money. We actually purchase the items outright from the artist, and then it is our responsibility to sell them in our storefront. And so the artists do get the money up front for their work which is something I guess a lot of places don't do anymore. And we do have buying periods now um, to where there's only certain times of the year that we purchase artwork. Oh, I can't see this. Okay, and so in our 75 years of being in existence, We've had to have a lot of partnerships to make sure that you know we're still around and we're still successful. Some of the organizations that we partner with are RTCAR, that stands for the Revitalization of Traditional Cherokee Artisan Resources. This organization is really important because what we found over the years due to development and private property laws, that it's really sometimes difficult for our artists to find materials to use. So we work with this organization. They help locate land, private landowners. They work with the State Forest Service to allow our artists to go and gather their materials on these other areas of land. And this might be something that you all are interested in. Um, I know a lot of you said that you worked, you know, with like foraging foods. And so it works similar to that. And we have a program, our natural resources program that we also work with to teach the practices to younger generations. So they're not going in without the traditional knowledge of how we gather our materials to keep it sustainable. And so it's really neat to see the organization and their work and creating these partnerships for the artists, but also for the older artists to work with younger artists and teach them um, how, you know, the proper practices for gathering their materials. The GCTC, that stands for the Greater Cherokee Tourism Council, and this is a partnership of all of our tourism organizations in Cherokee. So it includes our tribal government, um, tourism and marketing department, but it also includes our Indian village, our museum, our golf course, our fisheries and wildlife programs. And we meet regularly together to work on agreeing to a marketing plan for the whole Kuala boundary. And that way we're all sending a similar message. All of our advertising looks the same. And we're also you know, combining monies and pulling our money together to get a, a farther reach out to bring in tourism. And lastly, we partner a lot with Sequoia Fund. And this is a local CDFI that we have that helps with small businesses and entrepreneurship in our community. And uh, you all um, from other tribes may have CDFIs that work with you know, housing or other things, but ours mainly work, works with small businesses and um, just providing training. 
they have a component um, called Authentically Cherokee, and that is just for our artists. So we work with them to help our artists get training um, to be more professional, to have better business sense. So they do training on if you go to a trade show, for example, you know, how to set up your table. Uh, they do training on pricing. They offer training on um, how to package if you're going to ship materials, just different things like that. They help you write your bio, help you get business cards, um, just overall are available to help not just the artists, but also other small businesses. And these are really important for our artists because a lot of them aren't trained with that business sense. And so, you know, they make this wonderful artwork and work on these crafts and they're taught how to do that part of it. But then, you know, when it comes to trying to sell and figuring out, you know, how much they put into something and then how to break even and how to make profit is something that doesn't naturally come to them sometimes. And so these organizations work with us to help in that aspect. Another thing that we have that other people find really interesting is we created a permanent gallery and archives for our organization because some of our older artists, they were retiring from making their artwork or due to health reasons, weren't able to make their artwork anymore or they pass on. And so what we started doing is taking th those pieces of artwork and not selling them, but putting them, them in display so people can come and look. So we have a really great collection of artwork from the early and mid 1900s that is on display for people to see. And we keep it safe, it's not for sale. Um, a lot of families will come in to look at their family members work, maybe to use some of the designs or to see how they you know, made something. Um, sometimes they come in, we have patterns for carvings and they'll come in and we, we let them look at those so they can do carvings that some of their older family members may have made. And so that helps us keep a connection with our artists and with the community um, and keeps them coming in the door as well. And the archives, that was something that just kind of came about. We were cleaning out the attic and the previous, we've only had three managers for the organization and the previous management kept everything. And so we went through and found all the original documents from when the organization was created um, where people would sign in and they took their minutes. And that was that was really great to find. And so we um, archived that and we have that as a collect, the archive collection in the organization. And then, so Cherokee people, one of the, the, art, the artwork that we're most well known for is baskets, but we also have um, carving, wood carving, stone carving, weaponry, uh, musical instruments, and of course we have pottery, beadwork. Then we have people that are painting and uh, photography, making jewelry, things like that. So we have a, a big variety of artwork that we highlight in our store front. And so, since our organization has been around in the community for 75 years, we've taken on other things just because it, it was the right fit, because we have that reach and that relationship with our artists and the community. And so we write for grants, we get grant monies to do classes so that we can ensure, you know, younger members are taught traditional art forms. We have some younger members that come in and maybe the board decides, you know, they need a little bit more time to hone in their skills. And so we can pair them up with someone that can, you know, help them come along, can mentor them. And so that their artwork becomes a higher quality when they're making it. We recently received a grant to help with white oak identification. And this is mainly for basketry so there's one gentleman that 
goes out and gets a lot of the wide up materials for our basket makers. And he's getting older and he's only teaching, you know, one or two people how to do this. And so we wrote for a grant to allow him more time to work with some of our older wide oak basket makers that know how to identify the materials that are needed and prepare it. And we've also identified about 10 younger people that either, you know, have a lot of experience with identifying different kinds of trees or that are coming up in the basket making world. And so we've identified them and we're gonna partner them up together so that they can actually go out, learn how to identify the white oak trees used for basket making, prepare the material, and they'll end up with a finished basket. So they'll go through the dyeing process. Um, get, they'll actually gather natural dyes as well. And a major part of that is the sustainable harvesting that I talked about earlier. You know, we don't want to get in a situation to where, because these resources are so scarce right now anyway, we don't want to get into a situation where we have people that aren't knowledgeable going out and just, you know, decimating the supply population. We want to make sure that we have these supplies for future, future artists. Oh. So... I talk about that we, you know, we have a storefront and that's where people can come in and shop and buy the artwork, but it's so much more than that for our community. And it really is a celebration of all things Cherokee art. We do offer like, we have tourism and tourists come in, but also local people will come in to purchase art. In December, we have a holiday sale and we get most of our business during that time from our local community coming in and buying, you know, gifts for their family. And that's a way that we build relationships with other people. We're known for the organization, the contact, if an outside place wants to get in touch with Cherokee artists. Um, earlier, someone, when they introduced themselves, talked about, you know, there is a wallet for a lot of people in our communities. And if we build those relationships as an organization and they trust us to, you know, provide outlets for them other than ourselves to sell their artwork, then that just helps Cherokee grow. Um, we organize artists to go to our Mountain State Fair every year, which is about an hour away, but it gets a lot of traffic from all over the Southeast. So they will set up and demonstrate their work and sell their work at that festival and people reach out to us, you know, if they have a show or if they're looking for items to display or purchase, then we're able to connect them with some of our artist members. And so now I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about some of the artists that we have in their work. So this is Going Back Childhoski. And he was a wood carver, model maker, and a teacher. He taught woodworking to veterans in our community. And his niece, Amanda Crow, he influenced her work. She later went um, to art school in Chicago and came back to our community and taught wood carving. And probably every single wood carver that we have now is influenced by her work and therefore influenced by his work. And that's just really amazing. Some of the patterns that I was talking about earlier, um, people will come in. We have a collection of Amanda Crow's patterns and people will come in um, that are part of her family to utilize those patterns in their work also. And then next, we, this is Eva Wolf. She was a river cane basket weaver. And so river cane was the first, well, aside from bark, river cane was the first material that we used that was prominent in our area for basket making. And she really worked hard to make sure that the river cane basket making was passed down in her family. And we still are able to locate and use our natural root dyes in our area, which is a pretty big deal for basket makers 
in the Southeast, uh, many of them aren't able to find those dye materials anymore and they have to use commercial dyes. And so we're able, we'd use walnut um, for like a dark brown color, a butternut, which is a black color. And then we have blood root and yellow root. Blood root is a orange or red color. And then yellow root is a yellow color, of course. And so we utilize those to make different designs in the baskets. And then up next, one of our younger artists, this is Preston Bark. And he is a multimedia artist. He can do pottery, um, but he focuses on drawing. He's also a tattoo artist. He went to the Institute of American Indian Arts and uh, one of his quotes is, you have to become familiar with failure. And that's, I think about the process of, you know, being young and being an artist and, and trying to make it in that world. Um, and that goes back to the partnerships and, and the resources that we're able to offer our artists. This is Betty Maney. She does beadwork, basket making and pottery. She comes from a family of artists. Um, her mother and her sisters pretty much raised them on basket making um, and were able to support her and her brothers. She is an award-winning and highly decorated artist. She is part of a show that we have in the largest city to us is Asheville, North Carolina. They just opened a show at the Center for Craft that features some of Betty's work in it. And then she also works with traditional Cherokee techniques. Her and her sister, Mary, they actually have their own storefront and training facility near their home in one of our communities. And they're able to um, have classes and pass on their knowledge to other artists. Uh, one of the things that we're really happy about is we have a website for our organization now. It's koalaartsandcrafts.com. And you're welcome to visit it. We feature bios on our artist members. We talk about the partnerships that we have. There's contact information. We also have are working towards doing online sales. And one of the biggest challenges with the website is that a lot of our artwork that we get, it's one of a kind. And finding a system where that works with our inventory system. So if we sell something in the store, it's automatically take, you know, taken off the website. That's been one of the hardest challenges that we face. And then just having the staff to be able to, you know, take photos and descriptions and measurements and put that on the site so that we can sell it. But it's really important just because, you know, that's what the world is moving towards. And we have to have, you know, that online presence to be able to keep up with you know modern society. And so that's what we've been working towards in terms of the website. We recently received some money to redo the website. And so we think it's a little bit more user-friendly. Let's see these things. So if any of you, you know, are interested in trying to do something like that, we would be happy to to talk with you some more. Let's see. Oh, let me go back. There we go. And that's on the website. Another thing that I want to talk about when I worked at Koala Arts and Crafts, um, one of my main focuses was to kind of catalog all of our artists and get a photo of them and, you know, descriptions of their work and what kind of work that they do and kind of connect families together. We have a really awesome um, art program at, in our school system where our youth are exposed to um, Cherokee arts and crafts during school. And so if they don't have access to it in the home, they, also, they do have access if they go to our school system. And we've been working with them to try to incorporate some of those business skills also because of the talent, you know, that we have in our indigenous communities is so vast that I think it's really important that our youth really, and even our adults see it as an option for a career. 
Um, they don't have to, you know, sacrifice anything to be able to be an artist full time and to use their creativity to, you know, be, be their main source of income. I also worked really hard to get grant money so that we could provide classes to our artists, um, not just, you know, to pass on that knowledge and to pass on those skills, but also to teach the traditional methods that go into making these, you know, the arts and crafts and to, even though we have artists that are moving towards modern mediums, they still have aspects of our culture woven in. And so that's always integral and always important to them. And so I wanted to make sure that they were getting access to that information as well. Let's see. So this picture right here, it shows um, the different types of artwork. So we have basketry, beadworking, dolls, finger weaving, gourd carving, home goods, kids items, masks, miscellaneous, paintings and prints, pipes, pottery, shell carving, stone carving, storytelling, weaponry, and wood carving. And those are the, the categories that we recognize. And then our organization also is kind of a hub for just local art in general. So anytime there's going to be an art market or another organization, we started a fashion show. And so everyone always goes to Koala Arts and Crafts just to try to get the artists more involved in any of our art events that we do. Really sure. Right here. I'm trying to get back so I can see everybody's face. I had to move it around a little bit so that I could see the presentation and be able to talk to you. So right now, Vicki Cruz is the third manager of the organization. Like I said, we've only had three. I think that's actually been a benefit to the organization. Um, so she has actually worked for the organization for about 31 years. And I think about 20 of those has been as the manager. And she is really a great champion for the organization and for our artists in the community. Um, she's really dedicated her life to it. And I was talking to Pamela earlier. She asked me if I was an artist. And I said, well, I really don't consider myself an artist. I kind of dabble. I've done, you know, throughout my life, I've done almost every kind of arts and crafts that, you know, we say with, that we do. Um, right now, I just, I weave baskets. And that's something that, I go visit a lady in my community once a week and we just sit and talk and I work on the basket. I haven't actually gone out and cut a tree down and, you know, did that process. Um, so I just say that I weave them because I go and, and the materials are, almost, you know, almost ready for me just to start weaving. But it, it's good to have that experience just to have that appreciation for all the, you know, hard work that goes into it. Um, some of the teachers that I've had, you know, I, I work and they're very helpful and kind, but they also are able to, you know, teach me that it's important to do my best work and to, um, like, if there's a mistake that I have to take it out and fix it instead of, you know, just trying to cover it up or whatever. And so that's been really interesting for me to learn in my life. And I use those skills. Um, not just when I'm weaving baskets, you know, I use them in like my relationships and at my job. And um, so I moved over to, I'm, I work with a um, culturally based leadership program. So we have the youth council and adult program and, and we incorporate our into our programs because it's such an integral part of our culture. And so I'm always going to be connected to Kuala Arts and Crafts in some way or another. And I really love and support the organization. We do have, so since we were founded in 1946 and have, you know, are still around 75 years later, we do have other tribes that come and visit us often when they're trying to set up their own artist cooperative just to see how ours works. Um, and then they can take away 
what might work for them um, and utilize it how they see fit. So we're always happy to do that as well. I'll see, I don't know if there was any questions in the chat while I was talking, let's see. Do you want me to take it off the screen sharing? Tanya, it's okay to leave it there. Okay. If people have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask her a question. Hi, I have a question. So do you have um, classes to encourage some of the younger generations to come and explore the different crafts that they can do and kind of just open that curiosity in them? We do. So we offer classes at our organization um, just periodically and people can sign up and come in and take those. Usually um, it's grant funded, so we're able to provide everything at no cost. We also partner with um, our local schools and we send artists into the classroom. And so, I mean, it's as young as, you know, like daycare. And then we also even send artists into um, like our elder facilities um, so that they're able to do it. So it's all ages um, that we try to, you know, let them learn the artwork just because, you know, it's kind of a therapy outlet too. Like you don't, you know, have to use it to make income or anything off of it. And so we try to just make sure that that's an integral part of you know, just regular life for people in our community. Tony, I have two questions. My first question is, um, you talked about mentorships. So currently, how many mentors do you have in your organization? And then how many uh, mentees? That's a good question. So usually what we do is when we have a younger person apply for membership, and maybe the they're not going to get approved you know they're just their quality of work isn't there yet we'll pair them up with a person that is a skilled artisan and they meet and can work together so right now just off the top of my head trying to think we probably have about seven of those partnerships going um that are current and we just do it as the need arises and it's really informal, but we can provide them a place to meet if they need a, you know, a place to meet and just kind of foster that relationship. One of our members, she's actually, she's one of our potters and she's getting ready to have a series of classes for people that kind of have dabbled in pottery, but they don't make it regularly. And it's over a three month period, but they're gonna learn different techniques. She's going to show them how to set up a firing pit at their home so that they're able to do the entire process from start to finish at their home. Mm -hmm. So we just, it's just whatever people come in and we see, you know, can be a need in the community. Thank you. The second, the second question is, I was uh, very curious about the natural dyes. Can you, can you uh, give more information about that? Sure. So there's different times of the year to gather the dyes. Um, on the tree, the walnut and butternut, they're trees and you can use the um, bark or for walnuts, you can use that green hull also. And so you gather up and then they usually do it. You can either do it over an open fire, but like today they'll use, you know, like a propane tank and have a fire and they use big metal pots. So they'll put, their material, their natural material in the pot with the dye, fill it up with water and then boil it. Um, the longer you boil it, the, the more the dye takes. Usually about, I would say at least 12 hours. But once the dye takes, it doesn't run. Um, you know, like some commercial dyes might run into, like if you're weaving with them, if they get wet or something might run into your other splits, they don't do that. Um, and it's just kind of a really neat process that they have to go through to do it, but they, they still do. Thank you. Sounds very fascinating. That's why I was kind of gravitating towards it. Thank you. Yeah. I th they've used, um, we did a, 
uh, actually recently a tie dye workshop where people tie dyed shirts, but we used the natural dyes. And mm -hmm. um, that was a really neat project to be able to do kind of mix and, you know, modern with traditional. Tanya, one of the things that I really love about Kuala Arts and Crafts is that it's such a beautiful example of how, how a cooperative is actually an anchor institution in a community. And, you know, like the partnerships that you've built, you know, you're touching on environmental, you know, you're, you're teaching people how to, um, you know, how to harvest materials and be sustainable and do it in a good way. And I, I know that Vicki had mentioned that you guys had um, gotten trees one year and replanted the oak and the butternut throughout mm -hmm. the koala lands and that you have the dyes growing by the store. And, you know, I just, you know, things like that. And then the high school program with your BIE school is so wonderful that you're teaching these young people all of the, you know, all of the Cherokee arts that, you know, the traditional arts of our people to keep that alive. And um, it's just a beautiful example of what a cooperative has the potential to do and how it can really be more than just a buying and selling, you know, organization. It, it's so much more. And I, something I wanted to ask you about was um, that annual art fair, is that the one you were talking about, the, mar the mountain one? Or do you have one that comes to Cherokee? So Koala Arts and Crafts, we actually do one for our artist members. It's usually um, over Labor Day weekend. Okay. And we, our artists are able to set up at our storefront. We have like tents outside and do a little art market so they can sell. And then... The one that I was talking about, it's called the Mountain State Fair, and it's over in Asheville, well, really in Arden, North Carolina, but it it's like a, a normal fair, like they have a carnival and, and things like that. They also have like competition, you know, art competitions or livestock competitions, things like that. It's, it's kind of that kind of fair. So they have all different kinds of artists set up um, and Cherokee through Koala Arts and Crafts is, is part of that at the end. How big is, okay, first of all, do you own the building? Does the cooperative own its own building? Yes, the cooperative does own its own building. Um, and <laughs> that we own the building and our kind of our big parking area. So how big is the, how big is the store? Oh gosh, let's see. I would say maybe three, 3,000, no, 4,000 square feet, maybe. It's a pretty good size. And we yeah. have, so we have the storefront. And then like I said, we have like the archives and offices in the back. And then we have a permanent gallery space where people can go in and, and see that permanent collection I talked about. And it's a really nice room. We use it for, to host meetings and small events and things like that too. And then one more thing. I just have lots of questions. But you do you also offer repair of baskets? And do you also offer assessment? So that if somebody thinks that they've purchased Cherokee art, they can send it to you and you've got people there that can say, yes, this is, no, it isn't? We do. Um, that's more of a community effort. It really depends on what we get in. We do get calls from like auction places and just to verify authenticity and things like that. So we do that also. And we do offer repairs, um, not just to baskets, but you know, just any artwork, especially if it's something that they've bought in the store. Um, but we do, I mean, people really just don't know where to go. And so it, 
sometimes it's hard to find artists that will work on other artists work you know but um, we are able, able to usually provide that service to people it's not something that we advertise but we I guess we've kind of become known for it and we get a lot of people that come in like they're people that they have inherited collections from their parents or grandparents and and they don't you know really want to keep it and so we try to help them you know figure out a fair price for their collection and we know some collectors that will come in to purchase items and we've done, we've purchased items before too we have a um like when we price everything we have a tag that goes with it that um verify you know verifies that it's an authentic piece of artwork um and usually people hang on to those so when we see those come in with items that's really neat and we've also sorry we've also worked with the indian arts and crafts association quite a bit and they come out and visit um and talk to our artists um they came out at, about three or four years ago to talk about um, the new federal laws that were passed and explain, you know, explain that to our community and how to report, um, you know, people that might be saying that they're native and selling artwork and they're really not. I'm really, I'm really thankful that you all were able to introduce yourselves and I got to hear a little bit about the work that you all do. I think it's really wonderful just to hear, you know, what all the other tribes and, and people are doing in their communities um, to help preserve and teach, you know, their cultural aspects to, to everyone. I think it's just really wonderful. I want to thank you for doing that work. Sometimes it's like, I feel like we do very rewarding work, but it, it still can be difficult um, sometimes, you know, to get that across to people. I just wanted to quickly say thank you. And I've been chatting back here with Justin, getting the link so we can share it on our Facebook page. This was wonderful. And I, I really greatly appreciate your time. Well, I, I just want to thank you all for listening. I could talk about the organization and my experience there quite a bit. Um, I'm sure you all have these people and places in your communities that are just, they've always been there and they're just amazing places to just be and have wonderful people involved in them. And that's what I tell people like, you know, sometimes people get worried about the profits and the business side of it. And I'm like, no, the co-op, it's always going to be there. Like the people will, will take care of it. I just want to add, thank you so much. I mean, the other, the meeting the other day, and then this presentation is very helpful because I work in North and South Dakota and we're just now starting this. And this is very helpful to um, how we can begin it and move forward. There's little things that are happening, but not in the co-op um, frame. So that's what the, a lot of our, um, several of our tribes are angling for. So this has been very helpful. One thing that um, Pamela and Justin that I think would be helpful if we have a list of participants and contact information so we can just you know, an email list so we can reach out and if we have other questions and where we're moving forward with or how we can get, you know, assistance or how do we move forward? I mean, we're, like I said, we're just starting. So we would love to have any kind of assistant. And like Tanya said, that they're willing to help in any avenue and help assist us with anything. And this would be a great starting point. Yeah, so you're welcome to share my contact, my email um, with everyone. I'm happy to help. If you're ever in our area, please reach out. I'd love to show you around. Um, we, we just want to see, you know, all of our communities succeeding. I was going to ask you, are, do you know if you are a member of the IANTA? 
trying to remember what it stands for, but it's like a National American mm-hmm. Indian Tourism Association. They yeah. are they would be an amazing resource um, to help help you out if, if you're familiar with that organization. Yeah, that's under because I also work with George Washington University and there are big partnerships. We work in collaboration with IANTA. Awesome. Tanya, we're just so appreciative of this beautiful presentation and of you taking the time today to have this conversation with us and share with us. We're really, really grateful. And um, we just want to, you know, just again, say thank you, Wado, you know, for doing that with us today. Well, thank you for having me. I, re- I really enjoy it, talking about it and, and meeting you all and hearing what you're doing too. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I'll just echo what everybody else has said that this was such a, a great presentation. Um, it's amazing to learn about your work. And I have been putting some links in the chat. I just wanted to let everybody know these presentations, uh, we, uh, Koala Arts will be our 10th uh, cooperative that, that we've worked with on these presentations. And I just want to encourage folks to, to share uh, the links to these presentations out. Uh, it's a part of our goals to continue to use them as an educational tool to, to spread the word and share the stories on these great cooperatives. So please share them with other organizations, with Facebook groups. And then one last thing, I also put a link to our evaluation in the chat for today too. Um, that really helps us improve our program. So please complete that. Yeah. Justin, yeah. will all of these links that you have in the chat room be sent into an email also to a follow up? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll send the links out to everyone who who registered for today. So I'll send out I'll send out a large follow up email. Thank you. I'm old school, so I don't know how to do these chat thingies and all that other stuff. So. Oh, come on, you can do it, Steve. Yes. <laughs> Jeez, I have to learn how to do it, and I'm older than you. I know, but I just, I struggle with that, Babla. So just send it to me in an email with everything, and I'll follow up. Oh, I know. This technology is really stretching me in new ways. <laughs> so, I hear you there. And Justin, again, I just want to thank you for being um you know, for this partnership with with the Center for Rural Affairs and just the joy of working with you to get this done. And I just feel like we're so lucky because we have 10 interviews. We have one more on Monday with, um, we we hope people can attend it. It is going to be with the Arctic Cooperatives and it's their artist co-ops up in Canada and how they're doing their work. So everyone is invited to attend that too. And it's really a beautiful presentation. So we're really excited to have um, RJ Ramatan. He'll be the one sharing and he's been working with the artists for over 21 years up in the Arctic Circle. And um, what I love about up there is that he buys art from children as young as six years old. Because he said someday they may be a well-known carver or a painter or a weaver, and they support all of their artists. And um, so it's a really beautiful story with the Inuit communities up there. And um, so I hope that you can join us on Monday as well. We we tried to have San Javier uh, Farm um, Cooperative present, but geez, those guys are just so busy. And I... I wish that we could have them because they really have a wonderful presentation, but we'll catch them someday and get them recorded so that everyone can hear their story. So thank you so much. And Tanya, please thank Vicki too. I'm going to, I'm just going to have to come there and spend some time with you guys. And um, I feel like I know Vicki so well, and I'm so appreciative of the generosity of the spirit that you guys have in the community to share. Okay, well, thank you so much to Pamela for your facilitation and your outreach to make all this work possible.
it's it's been a great partnership and it, it, there's nothing else i think we can go ahead and close and let folks get to their friday afternoon but thank you so much again tanya yeah thanks everyone for taking the time to join us today and yeah stay tuned for the for the follow-up emails and the presentation links thank you so much take care everyone